Oh, for the love of all that's holy and unholy in this vast, ridiculous universe, why did it have to be humans? That was the collective thought ricocheting through the minds of every sentient being in the Galactic Council Chamber as the announcement was made. The esteemed Ambassador Zix Norp of the Blorpian Confederation, a gelatinous blob of purple goo with entirely too many eye stalks, was currently wishing he could melt into the floor, which, given his physiology, wasn't entirely out of the question. Esteemed colleagues, Zix Norp burbled, his voice translator struggling to convey both authority and barely concealed panic, after careful consideration and, frankly, a severe lapse in judgment brought on by one too many fermented nectars the Council has decided to invite, the humans, to our upcoming peace talks. The chamber erupted into chaos. Representatives from a thousand worlds began shouting, screaming, and in some cases spontaneously molting. A delegation from the methane-breathing gaseous nebula collective deflated in shock, while the silicon-based life forms from Crystalia shattered in distress. Order. Order Zix Norb's eye stalks flailed wildly, each one independently expressing a different emotion ranging from exasperation to outright terror. I know this decision may seem questionable. Questionable screeched Ambassador K. R. Ark of the Avian Alliance, his feathers puffing up to twice his normal size. It's bloody insane. Have you all lost your collective minds? Humans are death worlders. They eat spicy food for fun. A ripple of horrified gasps swept through the chamber. Several delegates crossed themselves, made the sign of the evil eye, or performed whatever gesture their species used to ward off unspeakable horrors. Zix Norp sighed, a sound like a deflating balloon. Yes, yes, I'm aware of their unique qualities, but hear me out. The Thoraxian Arachnoid War has been raging for centuries. We've tried everything else. Perhaps what we need is a fresh perspective. A completely insane, probably suicidal, fresh perspective. But humans whimpered Gloob, the representative from Slimoria Prime. They're so fleshy and loud, and they have those horrible bony protrusions they walk on. What do they call them? Feet Gloob shuddered, leaving a trail of slime on his hover chair. Not to mention chittered XBZTs to the Hive Collective, their endurance predators. Do you know what that means? They chase their prey until it dies of exhaustion. For fun. The chamber fell silent as everyone contemplated this horrifying fact. Even the Thoraxians and Arachnoids, mortal enemies locked in a millennia-long blood feud, exchanged glances of mutual terror. Zix Norp's primary eye stalk drooped in resignation. Look, I understand your concerns. But let's face it, we're out of options. The humans have a saying desperate times call for desperate measures, and if inviting a species that considers skydiving a relaxing hobby doesn't qualify as a desperate measure, I don't know what does. But Ambassador pleaded Florp, a sentient fungus from the planet Shroomtopia, have you considered the practical implications? Our peace talks are held in an environment of perfect harmony and tranquility. How will humans even survive? Their planet is a death trap of extremes. Zix Norp's eye stalks perked up, Ah, I'm glad you asked. Our xenobiology team has been working around the clock to create a special environment for our human guests. We call it the Danger Room. A holographic display flickered to life in the center of the chamber, showing a sealed habitat that looked like it had been designed by a committee of masochists and adrenaline junkies. As you can see, Zix Norp continued, his voice taking on a manic edge of forced enthusiasm. We've included all the comforts of home for our human friends. Gravity set to a bone-crushing 9.8 ms2, atmospheric pressure that would implode most species, and temperatures ranging from uncomfortably warm to why is my skin melting. The display zoomed in, showcasing various amenities. Here we have the extreme sports arena complete with simulated natural disasters. Earthquakes, tornadoes, volcanic eruptions, you name it, we've got it. And over here, the spice cabinet of doom filled with substances that would be classified as chemical weapons on most planets. The delegates watched in horror as the hologram displayed humans cheerfully engaging in activities that defied all logic and self-preservation instincts. Rock climbing without safety gear, consuming beverages that were literally on fire, and... Was that human intentionally falling from a great height with nothing but a flimsy piece of fabric to slow their descent? Sweet mother of mercy muttered Ambassador K.R.R.K. They really are insane. Zix Norb's eye stalks bobbed in what might have been agreement. Yes, well, that's rather the point. You see, colleagues, sometimes to solve an insane problem, 
you need an equally insane solution. And humans, they wrote the book on insanity. But how will this help with the peace talks, asked Gloob, leaving another trail of nervous slime. Excellent question, Zixnorp exclaimed, his voice reaching a pitch that threatened to shatter every crystal life form in the room. You see, we're not just inviting the humans to observe. Oh no, that would be far too simple. We're going to have them mediate. The silence that followed was so profound that you could have heard a Pingwian feather drop on Fluffatron 9, the galaxy's softest planet. Immediate XBZ finally managed to stammer. You want to put the fate of our galaxy in the hands of a species that thinks wrestling apex predators is a valid form of entertainment. Precisely Zix Norp was on a roll now, his eye stalks dancing with manic glee. I think about it. The Thoraxians and Arachnoids have been at each other's throats or mandibles or whatever for eons. What they need is someone so utterly, mind-bogglingly crazy that it makes their own conflict seem trivial by comparison. And you think humans are up to the task? Asked Florp skeptically. Oh, my dear fungal friend Zixnorp chuckled. A sound like bubbles popping in tar. Humans are not just up to the task. They'll probably invent six new extreme sports, start an interspecies rock band, and accidentally solve our galaxy's energy crisis while they're at it. The chamber buzzed with nervous energy as the delegates tried to process this insane plan. It was madness, pure and simple. But then again, wasn't that exactly what they needed? Very well, Ambassador Keirake said, his feathers finally settling. But I motion that we implement some safety protocols, for our own protection. Agreed, Zixnorp nodded, or at least jiggled in a vaguely affirmative manner. I propose we all undergo intensive physical training to prepare for human handshakes. Those things are lethal. And so, with a mixture of dread and morbid curiosity, the Galactic Council prepared for the arrival of their human mediators. Little did they know, the humans were about to turn their entire concept of diplomacy and sanity on its head. Captain Jane Danger Davidson of the Earth Diplomatic Corps motto Peace through superior firepower and really good barbecue stood before her crew, a motley assemblage of humanity's finest, or at least its most questionably sane. All right, you magnificent bastards, she bellowed, her voice carrying the gravitas of someone who had stared death in the face and asked it out for drinks. We've got a job to do. The galaxy's gone and got itself into a right mess, and it's up to us to sort it out. Her second in command, Lieutenant Commander Raj Spice Lord Patel, raised his hand. Captain, with all due respect, why us? Surely there are more qualified diplomats for this mission. Jane fixed him with a stare that could melt titanium. More qualified? Patel, did you or did you not once negotiate a peace treaty between two warring ant colonies in your backyard, using nothing but a bottle of hot sauce and a ukulele? Raj blushed. Well, yes, but... No buts, Jane interrupted. That's exactly the kind of outside-the-box thinking we need. This isn't your standard shake hands and sign treaties gig. We're dealing with species so alien, they think chocolate is a lethal weapon and consider our ability to crack our knuckles a dark sorcery. The crew exchanged glances, a mixture of excitement and terror dancing in their eyes. They were the misfits, the oddballs, the ones who looked at the impossible and said, hold my beer. Now Jane continued, pacing back and forth with the intensity of a caffeinated cheetah. I know you're all wondering about the mission specifics. Well, buckle up, buttercups, because it's a doozy. She activated a holographic display, showing two distinctly alien species. One looked like a cross between a praying mantis and a tank, while the other resembled a spider that had gotten way too into bodybuilding. Meet the Thoraxians and the Arachnoids. They've been at war for longer than humanity has been walking upright. Their conflict has decimated entire star systems, and they're both too stubborn to back down. Our job? Make them play nice. Private First Class Emma Boom Boom Chen, the team's demolitions expert, raised an eyebrow. And how exactly are we supposed to do that, Captain? Threaten to blow them all up if they don't behave. Jane grinned, a sight that had been known to make hardened criminals rethink their life choices. Oh, Emma, my sweet summer child, violence is so unimaginative. No, we're going to use our secret weapon. The crew leaned in, anticipation thick in the air. We're going to kill them with kindness, Jane declared triumphantly. A beat of silence followed, broken only by the sound of Sergeant Mike the Mountain Johnson facepalming so hard it echoed through the briefing room. Um, Captain Raj ventured cautiously. When you say kill them with kindness, you don't mean. 
I mean we're going to be so aggressively, overwhelmingly, mind-bogglingly nice that they'll have no choice but to stop fighting each other and unite in their shared bewilderment at our behavior. Jane explained, her eyes gleaming with the kind of madness usually reserved for those who willingly eat ghost peppers. The crew exchanged glances again, this time with the resigned acceptance of those who had long ago accepted that sanity was overrated. Now Jane continued, rubbing her hands together with glee. Let's go over our strategy. First up the welcome ceremony. We're going to greet both species with the traditional human welcome of a firm handshake and a slap on the back. But Captain protested Lieutenant Sarah Doc Martinez, the team's medical officer, the Thoraxians have exoskeletons that could shatter under that kind of force, and the arachnoids. Well, do they even have backs? Jane waved dismissively. Details, details. We'll figure it out as we go. The important thing is to show them we're friendly. Aggressively friendly. Next she plowed on, ignoring the growing looks of concern on her crew's faces. We're going to introduce them to the pinnacle of human diplomacy, the potluck dinner. A collective gasp went up from the crew. Even among humans, the potluck dinner was considered a high-stakes diplomatic maneuver, fraught with potential pitfalls and passive-aggressive casserole dishes. Captain Raj said slowly, Are you sure that's wise? We don't even know if they can eat our food. And remember what happened at the last intergalactic potluck. The Zorlak ambassador is still hiccuping antimatter. Jane's grin widened, taking on a slightly manic edge. Exactly. Nothing brings people together like the shared experience of gastrointestinal distress. Trust me, after a night of trying to digest Aunt Betty's mystery surprise casserole, their own war will seem positively trivial. The crew nodded reluctantly. There was a certain twisted logic to it. And for the peace de resistance, Jane announced, her voice dropping to a dramatic whisper, we're going to introduce them to the most powerful full force in the human arsenal. A concept so revolutionary, so mind-bending, that it will shatter their preconceptions and reforge the very fabric of their society. The crew leaned in, breaths held in anticipation. We're going to teach them. Dad jokes. The silence that followed was broken only by the sound of Sergeant Johnson's head repeatedly hitting his desk. Captain Raj said carefully, as if explaining to a child why they couldn't keep a pet black hole. Don't you think that might be a bit? Much? I mean, dad jokes are considered a form of cruel and unusual punishment in some sectors. Jane's eyes gleamed with the light of a thousand exploding supernovae. Exactly, Raj. They'll be so busy groaning at our puns that they'll forget all about trying to annihilate each other. It's foolproof. As the crew tried to process this uniquely human approach to galactic diplomacy, Jane clapped her hands together. All right, people, we've got work to do. Patel, I want you to compile a list of the worst dad jokes in human history. Chen, you're in charge of preparing the potluck dishes the spicier, the better. Johnson, start working on your firm handshake. I want to see those alien appendages quivering. And Martinez stock up on antacids. Something tells me we're going to need them. As the crew dispersed to their tasks, a mix of resignation and manic excitement in their steps, Jane allowed herself a small, satisfied smile. The galaxy thought it had seen everything. Well, they hadn't seen anything yet. Humanity was about to teach them the true meaning of peace talks, even if it killed them, which, given the intensity of Aunt Betty's casserole, was a distinct possibility. The day of the peace talks arrived with all the subtlety of a supernova in a glitter factory. The Galactic Council's chosen neutral ground a space station ominously named the Crucible of Diplomacy, hung in the void like a cosmic disco ball, its hull gleaming with the nervous sweat of a thousand anxious diplomats. Inside, the atmosphere was tenser than a Vulcan poetry slam. The Thoraxians and Arachnoids had arrived earlier, each delegation eyeing the other with the kind of loathing usually reserved for people who talk during movies. They were separated by a demilitarized zone that included three force fields a moat of acid, and a particularly grumpy Blorvian swamp beast named Steve. As the appointed hour approached, a hush fell over the assembled aliens. Even the background hum of the station's life support systems seemed to hold its breath. And then, with a fanfare that sounded suspiciously like the theme from Rocky the Doors slid open to reveal with the humans, Captain Jane Danger Davidson strode in, leading her team with the confidence of someone who had either completely misunderstood the gravity of the situation or understood it all too well and simply didn't give a damn. 
she was resplendent in what she insisted was the formal diplomatic uniform of her people, a Hawaiian shirt, so loud it was probably violating several noise ordinances, cargo shorts with enough pockets to hide a small moon. And to the horror of every sense offended alien in the room socks with sandals, greetings, fellow sentience Jane boomed, her voice carrying the cheerful menace of a tsunami that had decided to throw a beach party. We come in peace, bearing gifts of goodwill, questionable fashion choices, and a potato salad that may or may not achieve sentience by the end of the day. The silence that followed was so profound that several species evolved the ability to hear into previously unknown frequency ranges just to fully appreciate its depth. Ambassador Zick Snorp, his eye stalks twitching with a mixture of dread and morbid fascination, oozed forward to greet the human delegation. See Captain Davidson. He burbled, his translator struggling to convey both respect and abject terror. On behalf of the Galactic Council, I bid you welcome to the crucible of diplomacy. Jane grinned, a sight that caused several nearby plant-based lifeforms to instinctively curl their leaves. Thanks, Zix. Mind if I call you Zix? Great. Now where are our guests of honor? I've got a piece to broker and a potato salad that's getting restless. With a flourish that sent several of her shirt's palm trees into a frenzy, Jane produced two enormous gift baskets from seemingly nowhere. For the Thoraxians and Arachnoids, a little taste of earth to kick things off. The leaders of the two warring factions approached cautiously, their respective guards twitching with barely suppressed violence. Grand exarch click-clack of the Thoraxians, a being that looked like the unholy offspring of a praying mantis and a battle tank, extended a cautious appendage towards the gift. What manner of explosive is this he chittered suspiciously? Jane laughed, a sound that made several crystalline beings vibrate in harmony. Oh, click-clack, you kidder! It's not an explosive. Well, not technically, though I'd advise opening the jalapeno poppers in a well-ventilated area. On the other side, Supreme Weaver skitter sketch of the arachnoids peered at her basket with all eight eyes. Is this some kind of human weapon? A biological agent designed to decimate our forces. Only if you count laughter as a weapon Jane declared, slapping skitter sketch on what she hoped was a back. The resounding clang suggested she might have miscalculated. It's a collection of Earth's finest delicacies and some of our most beloved cultural artifacts. I'm particularly excited for you to try the Pez dispensers. They're like little plastic humans that vomit candy when you bend their heads back. Both alien leaders recoiled in horror, their gift baskets held at arm's length by very confused aides. Zick Snorp, sensing the growing tension, attempted to steer the proceedings back on track. Perhaps we should move to the conference room and begin the official talks. Excellent idea, Zixi my man Jane exclaimed, throwing an arm around the gelatinous ambassador's shoulders, upper blob region. But first, I think it's time we broke the ice. Lieutenant Commander Patel, if you would do the honors. Raj stepped forward, clearing his throat nervously. Ahem. Why don't scientists trust atoms? He paused for dramatic effect, painfully aware of the blank stares from the assembled aliens. Because they make up everything. The silence that followed was broken only by the sound of Sergeant Johnson's palm meeting his forehead at approximately Mach 2. Oh, come on. That was gold, Jane protested. Tough crowd. All right, how about this one? Why don't skeletons fight each other? They don't have the guts. A Thoraxian guard in the back let out a confused chirp that might have been a laugh, only to be immediately tackled and sedated by his comrades. Captain Zixnor pleaded, his eye stalks drooping with desperation. Perhaps we should proceed to the actual negotiations. Jane waved a hand dismissively. Nonsense, Zix. Everyone knows the key to good diplomacy is to start with a shared meal. To the banquet hall. And with that, she marched off, her team following in her wake like a colorful, slightly deranged honor guard. The assembled aliens, caught between curiosity and an overwhelming instinct for self-preservation, had no choice but to follow. The banquet hall, hastily prepared to accommodate the human's insistence on a proper sit-down, was a sight to behold. The table groaned under the weight of dishes from a hundred worlds, each more baffling than the last. At the center, like a culinary atom bomb waiting to detonate, sat Aunt Betty's mystery surprise casserole. Now then, Jane announced, taking her seat at the head of the table with a flourish that sent several smaller alien delegates ducking for cover, let's dig in. Nothing brings people together like shared gastrointestinal distress. 
What followed could only be described as culinary warfare. The humans attacked their plates with gusto, shoveling foods of questionable origin and even more questionable physical properties into their mouths with reckless abandon. The aliens watched in horrified fascination as Captain Davidson cheerfully crunched her way through what appeared to be a live Zorgon slug, pausing only to comment on its pleasantly zesty flavor. Grand Exarch click clack, mandibles quivering with a mixture of disgust and reluctant admiration, leaned towards Supreme Weaver Skitterscatch. Perhaps he chittered quietly, we have underestimated these humans. Skitterscatch's eyes swiveled in agreement. Indeed, any species that can survive, this, must be formidable indeed. As the meal progressed, something strange began to happen. The initial terror and disgust gave way to a sort of manic camaraderie. Thoraxians and arachnoids found themselves united in their shared bewilderment at human-eating habits. Jokes were tentatively exchanged, most of them at the expense of the increasingly frazzled Ambassador Zixnorp. By the time dessert rolled around a terrifying concoction that Jane introduced as flaming baked Alaska the atmosphere had shifted from thinly veiled hostility to something approaching convivial chaos. And then Jane was saying, gesticulating wildly with a spoon that still had flames licking its edges. The human says to the Martian, that's not my rover, that's my wife. The joke made absolutely no sense to anyone present, but the sheer absurdity of it all, combined with the effects of whatever hallucinogenic spices had been in the main course, sent the room into uproarious laughter. In the midst of this pandemonium, Click Clack turned to Skitterscatch, his mandibles set in a serious line. You know, he said, his voice barely audible over the sound of Lieutenant Chen teaching a group of methane breathers how to do the Macarena. I can't for the life of me remember why we started this war in the first place. Skitterscatch's eyes blinked in rapid succession, a sign of deep thought in her species. Nor can I, she admitted. Something about disputed territory in the Zeta Quadrant. Zeta Quadrant click clack exclaimed. But that's been a black hole for the last three centuries. They stared at each other for a long moment. The absurdity of their millennia-long conflict suddenly laid bare. Well, Skitterscatch said slowly, this is rather embarrassing. Click clack's antennae twitched in agreement. Indeed. Perhaps, perhaps it's time we put this foolishness behind us. And there, in the midst of a human-induced chaos that threatened to tear the very fabric of space-time, the longest-running conflict in galactic history came to an end. Not with a bang, but with the shared realization that their war had been, in the grand scheme of things, about as sensible as a chocolate teapot. As Grand Exarch Click Clack and Supreme Weaver Skitterscatch shook appendages, or in Skitterscatch's case, several appendages over the smoking remains of Aunt Betty's casserole, sealing their newfound peace, Captain Jane Danger, Davidson leaned back in her chair, a satisfied smirk playing on her lips. Mission accomplished, she murmured, raising a glass of something that was either a very potent alien liquor or possibly rocket fuel. Humanity won, galactic conflict zero. Beside her, Raj leaned in, his expression a mixture of awe and lingering disbelief. Captain, he whispered, how did you know this would work? Jane's grin widened, taking on that special brand of madness that only humans seemed capable of achieving. Raj, my boy, let me tell you a secret she leaned in conspiratorially. I didn't. But if there's one thing humanity has learned over the centuries, it's this when all else fails, throw a party so bizarre, so utterly chaotic, that everyone forgets why they were fighting in the first place. As if to punctuate her point, a cheer went up from the other end of the table where Sergeant Johnson was arm wrestling a Thoraxian warrior while balancing a spoon on his nose. Now then, Jane said, standing up and clapping her hands for attention. Who's ready for karaoke? The collective groan that rippled through the assembled aliens was music to her ears. Peace, it seemed, had been achieved, and all it had taken was a liberal application of humanity's most potent weapon sheer, unadulterated chaos. In the days that followed, the galaxy watched in stunned disbelief as the Thoraxians and Arachnoids, once bitter enemies, embarked on a joint cultural exchange program. The reports filtered in, of Thoraxian battle tanks being repurposed for extreme sports competitions, while arachnoid webs were being used to create the largest trampolines the universe had ever seen. The Galactic Council, still reeling from the unexpected success of their desperate gambit, found themselves inundated with requests from other warring factions. Everyone, it seemed, wanted the humans to mediate their conflicts. Ambassador Zix Norp, hailed as a visionary for his unconventional approach to diplomacy, 
was last seen being fitted for a Hawaiian shirt of his own. His eye stalks, observers noted, seemed to have developed a permanent twitch. As for Captain Jane Danger Davidson and her crew, they returned to Earth as heroes, their mission hailed as a triumph of human ingenuity and insanity. The Earth Diplomatic Corps saw a surge in applications, with ability to tell dad jokes under pressure becoming a key recruitment criterion. In the grand tapestry of galactic history, the Thoraxian Arachnoid peace talks would be remembered as the moment when the universe realized a fundamental truth. Sometimes, the best way to solve a problem is to introduce a bigger, more chaotic problem and let it sort itself out. And as for humanity, well, they were just getting started. After all, there were still plenty of conflicts to resolve, cultures to bewilder, and exotic foods to eat on a dare. The galaxy, for better or worse, would never be the same again.